record on here. And so today we're going to be diving into inspection reports and some of the feedback from the people here in the office is knowing what sort of repairs and what things to focus on. We're like, what things should we be concerned with? How do we explain it to like a first time home buyer? Um, how do we differentiate the different sections on like the termite report section one versus section two? Um, and then also um, looking for specific things on the report, like the foundation, electrical and stuff like that. Um, so before I have a couple, I have a report that I'm going to pull up and we're just going to kind of go through it, but I always just want to start off with just kind of setting the stage. And I think this is a good, a good thing for you guys to do with your clients is if you are buying a home that is not brand new, there are going to be issues with it, right? There's always deferred maintenance. So, um, and I think it's important to differentiate what's like a major issue versus just deferred maintenance that happens over time, right? Um, how many of you guys own a car that's more than five years old? Raise your hand if your car is more than five years old, right? Okay. Um, so if your car is more than five years old, after five years, like there's things you got to fix, right? Like you have some major items that you got to fix. Maybe you got to, uh, I don't know, mess with the transmission, like major tune-ups, right? And that's why on cars, like when you hit certain mileage on cars, there's certain like major, uh, major fixes that you got to do. It's the same thing with a home, right? as the home gets a little bit older, there's going to be things that happen because you have all kinds of the, the elements that affect it, the normal wear and tear. Um, you got just things that, you know, from the, the elements outside, right? Like the weather and the rain and all those different things that happen. So I think what you got to explain, like the way that I'm explaining this to you guys is this is what you want to explain to your clients. Hey guys, when we're out here looking at these homes, just know like we're not, if we're not looking at new construction and we're looking at resale, most of the homes in our area are going to be probably 20 years to maybe 60 years old, right? Like in your average communities, right? And so anything that's 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, there's going to be some things that, that go on with it, right? And so what you got to ask yourself, Mr. Client, is um, am I, is this okay for me? Is this something I can live with, right? Is this something that is fixable? Is it within my budget? Is it something that I can live with? Um, and is there going to be some like major thing that comes about from these repairs later down the line? Like if you go to my house, my house is probably 40, 50 years old. Like I know if I go around the house, like on the eaves, there's probably some dry rot, right? right? Just because those get hit with rain. So that's pretty typical, right? You'll have some water damage, some dry rot. But the rest of my house is like remodeled because I remodeled it a few years back, right? But there's little things where you, if you start really looking closely, there's going to be certain things that are wrong with it. Now, whether I decide to fix it or not is up to me. Like to me, the dry rot stuff, I probably should fix it, but it's not a major issue for me right now. So I'll probably just address that a little bit later on um, when I you know, have the budget or I want to go and change all the eaves out and stuff like that. Um, but it's something that I could live with right now. Um, so those are like deferred maintenance things, but then you have like some of the major items, which is now where you're looking at, like kind of what Brian said, where you're looking at foundation, you're looking at roof, you're looking at electrical systems, plumbing systems, the major systems of the property. If there are some issues with that, then those are things you want to look into a little bit more closely because those could be a little bit more costly, right? Now, anything on a property, I would say 99.9% .9 of things that go on with the property can be fixed. The question is how much, how much does it cost, right? And you got to ask yourself, is that worth trying to negotiate on? Or is it just accepting like, hey guys, these are the types of homes I'm looking at, right? If I go shopping for a used car and I'm looking at cars that are all five years or more old, none of them are going to be brand new. Some of them are going to be taken care of a little bit more than the others, but they're all probably going to have some things that I have to address over time. Right. So that's kind of, that's what I would explain to my clients. Um, like kind of Mark asks is how do we explain that? And you want to do that before you start looking at things. And before you start looking at reports, you kind of want to set the stage from the beginning um, because your job is to not be an expert in everything. You're not a contractor. You're not a, a plumber. You're not an electrician. Right. If you have some of that background, well, that's definitely a plus, right? Because then you could bring that to the table, but your job is not to be the expert. Your job is to know how to explain it 
how to differentiate what's something major versus minor, and then how to point them in the right direction and give them options so that they can make the best and most informed decision. That's really what your job is as an agent, right? And as you do this more and more and you close more sales, then you will naturally kind of become a lightweight expert in some of these fields, right? Jason and I, because we've, we have experience with flipping property, we've done over 80 projects since 2010. And so we've been in, in the construction field, right? Like we're not contractors, but we know a lot because we've bought a lot of properties. We've met with a lot of contractors. We've renovated properties. We've looked at reports. We've decided what to fix, what not to fix. And so through that experience, we can definitely point someone in the right direction and give them probably more information than the average agent. But there are things that I'm not going to know. And that's where I say, hey, let's call our contractor. Let's call our electrician. Let's call our plumber and see if that's something that we need to be concerned with. So I think the, the, to kind of make that point, guys, is know what you know, know how to point people in the right direction, know how to explain what their options are, and know who knows what you don't know, basically, right? <laughs> right? Know how to go find the answer, basically, right? Um, most things can be Googled. And if you just were to ask, you know, our team, does anybody know an electrician? Guarantee you we know one. Does anybody know a contractor? Yes. Anybody know a foundation guy? We have all these people in our, in our, uh, our phone book, right? And these are people you can call, you can run uh, scenarios by, you can send a picture to, and they can give you a quick, like, Hey, this is a concern or, Hey, that's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, and you kind of go from there and, and you point your client in the right direction. Does that make sense guys? Okay. Cause I think, I think that's probably one of the most important things out of this, because once we go into the reports, like some of it's going to make sense. Some of it's not. And, but you just need to know that like everything can be figured out. Yeah. Right. And, and you need to be able to put your client at ease as you're explaining some of these things. Yeah. And really quick, TK, I think it's important to role play that part of it. Right. The inspections are going to go line to line. But yeah. But role playing that, just letting them know exactly the way to reach it. Say, like, hey, you know what? You can go to Dean's house, you can go to Dean's car, and you know, all those things. But role play that because that, you have to do that with confidence. Right. Because again, the, the appraiser or the inspector's job is to highlight everything. Yeah. Right. So you got to you got to say, hey, you know, and let them know, you know, you just kind of set that expectation. And that makes the conversation a lot easier because now all you're going to do is read the reports. Yeah. Right. And you're helping them figure it out. Right. And every house is different. Right. So the, so you're kind of figuring it out together, to be honest. Right. Like because you don't know this house. You go show them a house. Now they're interested. Now we request disclosures. Now we look at the inspections and we're kind of figuring this thing out together. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're just the one that's leading them through that through that process, right? And that's really what your role is. Um, okay, any questions on that, guys? Does that make sense? And Kiki, just kidding, because some of you guys have done this before. Is there something that you guys do when, before he jumps into the report? I'm looking at Mark, so I know Mark's recently done it. Francisco's done it, right? And I know Brian's done it, so is Andre. Is there anything that you guys want to add in that scenario where before you look at those inspections? I mean, I think... I could, I don't want to spend on my behalf, but for me, I feel like over time, I've just picked it up more and more and more. Like the NHD reports, all the stuff I've been talking with Jim and Real and like other contractor people. And so like you start just identifying yeah. estimates and starts just coming in routine. Yeah, exactly. So uh, through time, you're starting to just kind of, it's all starting to make sense, right? Okay. Um, anything else? Anything Anything else? Um, oh, the qualification zones. What was that? That's something that I just found out about recently. It's actually significant around the Bay Area. What is it? Liquefaction zones. Liquefaction zones. Yeah. See, I don't even know what that yeah, is, right? So, <laughs> you know, this area used to be a water running from San Jose Mountain down. Okay. And so that area actually has a huge flowing water system underwater. And so, like, there's actually, during earthquakes, huge amounts of, like, land movement, which can cause the home to just collapse. Yes. Okay. Well, there you go. We just learned yeah, something yeah, new, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, liquefaction zones, Science. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's where, you know, you'd probably want to Google and understand what that is and then know who the appropriate person to turn to yeah. if, some, if something like that comes up. Uh, okay, so let's not get too in the weeds, guys. I want to stick to just the uh, inspections and the inspection report. So we're going to look at two different reports. We're going to look at the property inspection and then we're going to look at the termite inspection. So let's start off with property. Um, bam. Okay, so here's the property report for a home that we just actually sold and what's cool let me go to the beginning uh, and so what's cool about this is it has a whole like table of contents right on here 
And so here's what I do. I'm going to tell you exactly what I do, right? I'll look at the report. I'll see the first thing I'm looking at is the first page. And I'm seeing when was the report done, right? This is the right house. Yep. This report was just done in February 27th, right? So it's within the last, you know, 30 days or so. And um, I typically want to make sure the report was done within the last 30, maybe to 90 days at the most. 90 days is kind of cutting it close. Because sometimes you can have different seasons that happen, right? Like if it was summertime and now it's winter and it's more than 90 days and we had a big storm, right? That can expose, you know, leaks or anything like that. So 30 days is typically where you want to be. More than 90 days, I'm probably going to, uh, more than 30 days, I'm probably going to advise my clients, do we go get our own reports, right? But for starters, I'm looking at the date. And then what I do immediately is I go to the end of the report because every single one of these inspection reports has a summary page. So I just jumped to summary and I'm just gonna click on that. And basically the summary is gonna be everything that the inspector identified that you probably need to take a look at a little bit closer, right? And so this is how you can quickly look at an inspection report and just see like what you're working with. And then from there, I can go to the individual section, right? And get a little bit more detail on that particular item. Right. So let's look at this report. So I'm going to summary and I'm going to scroll down. And this is what he's saying that needs to be repaired. Fiber cement siding, damaged fiber cement siding was observed at one or more areas. We recommend all damaged material to be repaired or replaced if necessary. Right. So siding is like the side of the house, right? The little siding, the panels or whatever that goes on the side of the house. To me, right off the bat, that's not a major item right? Like if you have, I know the age of this home, it's not that old. It's like maybe 20 years old. Siding, if there's some little damage here and there, it's not that big of a deal. So I'm like, okay, I'm not even tripping off that, right? Trim, some of the trim at one or more of the areas are damaged. Trim can be like the baseboard, the trim around the door, not a deal killer, right? Some of that is just kind of uh, cosmetic, right? Where maybe it's damaged, Maybe it got hit by water, maybe it got bumped, maybe it got chipped, whatever that might be. Um, so I'm looking at that. Um, eaves, soffits, or fascia. Um, sections of the roof framing are damaged. We recommend repair or replacement. The current pest report may provide more details. Okay, so if there's sections of the roof, these are the eaves that go around the roof, which is like all the wood trim and everything that holds the roof up. Um, and it also says that this is gonna be on the pest report, right? So this is something like, Okay, I'm going to pay attention to a little bit, right? Um, not that damaged eaves are a big deal, but it just depends how much, right? If it's a few little things here and there, it's not that big of a deal, right? But if it's a lot, once we start getting into it, then that might be something that we want to go back and, and try to negotiate or we want to take into account um, when we're making our offer, right? The price and an inspection period and stuff like that. Um, exterior plumbing. Leakage was observed at the main water shutoff valve. We recommend it be repaired. Um, basically, this is the valve. It is leaky a little bit. I'm sure if any of you guys go to one of your houses and you go see like the water hose in the back, it's probably a little drip coming off of it, right? Those just happen over time. That's not a big deal, but I'll look into it a little bit more. Um, evaporator coil. The catch pan is corroded from the leakage from the evaporator coil. Who knows what an evaporator coil is? Anybody know what that is? The AC condenser. Yeah, so the AC, um, there's a little bit of leakage from the coil. The coil is like what all like the, the whatever, the chemical that goes into there that helps keep the house cool. Um, it seems like there's a little bit of a leakage. Um, stuff like that, guys, like little leaks here and there, those aren't that big of a deal. Those are things that can be repaired relatively easy um, by the appropriate professional. Um, windows, uh, the operation of several metal horizontal sliding windows is rough. This is usually caused by the plastic guides or metal rollers on the bottom of the windows being worn and the windows have metal to metal contact. We recommend all worn parts be replaced. The house is 20 years old. The windows aren't brand new. So as you keep opening them and sliding them back and forth, after a while, those little tracks start to get a little bit worn out. Um, windows are still good but they're just a little bit rough, right? That's not a big deal. That's not necessarily a deal killer. Um, doors, broken or cracked glass that was observed in the rear sliding door. So with this particular property, um, 
the client came home one day and there was their sliding door was cracked. They don't know if it got hit by something or whatever or bumped into, but the sliding door was cracked. This was something that we thought was going to be uh, a concern with some buyers, right? Because if they got to replace the whole sliding door. And so we chose to get this fixed before we put the house on the market, just FYI, right? But how much was it to fix a, a, a panel, a pane of glass, right? 500 bucks maybe like installed. So it still even wasn't a big deal, but for us, for marketing purposes, we decided to fix it. Um, glass enclosure, the seal on the side of the master bathroom shower is damaged or missing. We recommend it be replaced to keep water from leaking out of the enclosure. Um, sinks, tubs, toilet, the master bathroom toilet was loose. If you keep sitting on a toilet over and over and over guys, it's going to get loose, right? I, this is probably one of the most common things that we see in properties is after a while the toilets get loose. You have a little wax ring. They got to get tightened up, right? Stuff like that. Not a big deal. A loose receptacle, right? Receptacle plug in the wall. Got to go tighten that thing up. Not a big deal. Kitchen, a receptacle, receptacle cover in the kitchen exhaust is damaged. So do you know, do you guys know what that is? What is that? Receptacle, receptacle cover. Yeah, it's just, it's just like a little cover plate, right? Little cover plate. Just like on their outlets, you have that little white little plate. On this one, there's probably like a little plate that goes on there. <laughs> right but here's the thing um you guys are asking like who is this inspector but remember it's the inspector's job they're making an observation so when they're walking in the property they're not on anybody's side right they're a third party they're non-biased their job is to just basically say what do i see that needs to be fixed or cracked or whatever addressed on this property right so sometimes the sometimes the sellers like if you're representing the seller and they see these they're like man is this inspector like not on our side you're trying to make this thing look bad, right? And once again, what you have to explain to the seller is the same thing that we explained to the buyer. Hey, you guys, your, your house is 20 years old. There's things that go on that you probably don't even notice because you live here every day and that's just how it is, right? And you're fine with that. But these are all just, it's pretty much anything that we see. Um, so don't worry, right? Like any competent buyer's agent is going to explain that to their client as well, right? What we're concerned with is we're concerned with big items that cost thousands of dollars. That's what we're concerned with in our market because our market's a seller's market. There's not a lot of inventory. Someone's going to buy this house regardless. And even if there is thousands of dollars worth of work, someone's probably still going to buy it and they're probably still going to give you a really good offer. It's one, it's like, I would say when you, when you want to make, be concerned is if when the dollar amount starts exceeding like 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, then you know there's probably going to be some sort of either negotiation or the price is probably going to be a little bit less when they offer it, right? Um, but anything I would say under 10000 bucks in our area, if you think about that, like on a million dollar house, it's only 1% of the total transaction. It's not, there's leeway, right? It's not that big of, of a deal when people are paying a million dollars, right? Any questions on that, guys? Okay, let's keep going through this. Uh, local disconnect, scorch marks. So this is something that we actually addressed. Investigate further. Scorch marks were observed on the inside of the local disconnect indicating a past fire or under fusing. We recommend further inspection by an electrician to determine if the panel should be replaced. So this was like part of the panel outside. There was like burn marks on one of the, uh, the breakers. So that is something because that's part of the electrical. That is something that we want to be concerned with, right? Is, is it something major? Is it something minor? Further investigation. So what we did was we called our electrician. I took a picture of it. I took a picture of the report, that section. I sent a picture of the panel and I sent it to my electrician. My electrician responded back. It's not a big deal. He goes, there's multiple reasons why that could have happened. It could be a loose wire. You got to go tight, right? And when it's loose, it causes a little bit of friction. He goes, it could be um, maybe that breaker is just bad and it just needs to be replaced. And so what ended up happening with this was it was 400 bucks to replace it. So we called the electrician. He went out there. He replaced the whole breaker thing, put a brand new one, 400 bucks, and that was done. Nothing else was wrong with the whole electrical system. But 
if you are a, a buyer or seller and you don't know that and you just look at this, you see the word fire, past fire, right? Yeah. It's, alarming. it's alarming, right? So this is a perfect example of when your client might see something, get alarmed, and it's your job to say, hey, hey, wait a minute. Things like this can happen, right? Let's see if this is something major or something minor. That's why it says investigate further. So let's investigate a little bit more, right? And we go from there. Um, leaks. There was staining on the underside of the roof sheathing and framing. This is an indication of past leakage. We recommend consulting with the owner and occupant concerning past leaks and the scope of repairs. So basically, this is like saying that there could have been a leak in the roof, right? Do leaks happen in roofs, guys? Yeah, we have one right here, right above us right now, right? It happens, right? You have nail holes, right? You have different things that happen, the rain, whatever it might be, water finds its way to get in, right? A lot of times it's not a big, big deal if it's not a major leak. If it's a small little leak and there's stains, some people just leave it alone, right? Now, if it's causing a lot of damage and like all the boards are all messed up and all that stuff, then that's probably something you're gonna wanna get repaired. Um, but that's why it says also investigate further. Sometimes you could have had a leak in a roof and it was repaired, meaning it was patched up, but the wood was never changed, right? Because just because wood gets wet doesn't mean the wood is bad. It just has to dry, right? And you have to just stop whatever's making it leak. Um, and once it dries, there still might be a little stain, but there's no longer a leak, right? Same thing like that panel right there. Everybody look up at this little panel right there. You guys see that? That, that stain. Mm -hmm. So there's no leak anymore, but what do we have to replace? Panel. The panel. That panel is probably like 10, right there, 10 bucks. There's another one right there, 10 bucks, oh. right? And we didn't, the only, the only way that got exposed was because when we had heavy rain, then they found out that there was a, a little leak in the roof, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, I don't even know if both of those were from the rain. I think some of them were from the AC unit. Oh, okay. The condensation was leaking and they fixed that. Now just the panel's got to get changed out. So it's like literally the leak was fixed, probably looking at 20 bucks to replace those panels, All right? Uh, <laughs> okay, and that's it guys, like that's the summary, right? So which one of these that stands out to you guys would you think like, okay, now I'm gonna go back and like look further at the details. The electrical one, right? Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do now, right? So uh, scorch marks. So local disconnect number 13. So then if you look right here, you have electrical. So I'm gonna click on electrical. And so each, it's broken down into sections, right? Emergency controls, roof, exterior, grading and drainage, garage, electrical, plumbing, water heater, uh, heating, AC, interior, windows, bathrooms, kitchen, laundry, attic, insulation, structure, environmental concerns. So electrical, this is the electrical section. So in the electrical section, they're gonna tell you a description of what kind of electrical it has, right? Um, this, has, this is a newer home, newer meaning 20 years old. So it has updated electrical. When you get like those old, old homes, like, in, like downtown, they have like knob and tube wiring. That's like the old school stuff. Those things typically need to get replaced. Um, and updated to like the newer electrical stuff, right? But there are people that have old houses and it still has knob and tube and everything works fine and they're fine with it. Is it the most efficient, right? No, but for some people, like they don't wanna spend 10 grand rewiring the whole entire house, right? Cause that is a tedious process. You gotta cut open the walls, all kinds of stuff. And so it can be costly if you wanted to update the whole electrical system. Um, it's going to tell you uh, the service entrance, like how is the electrical coming into the property from the street? It's underground. Um, the capacity, they don't know because they're not testing the capacity necessarily. Um, is there a main panel? Is there a sub panel? Sub panels in the garage. So you guys know when you go in a garage, there's that little sub panel right there. That's a sub panel that connects to your main panel, wherever the electricity comes from in your property. Um, what type of wires, what type of receptacles. And so he's just going to give some overall uh, observations and recommendations. Some of this, guys, is, um, 
is like a template, just FYI, right? When, the, when they repair these reports, when they prepare the reports, the report is usually a template and then they just go fill in like the blanks for that property. So a lot of this like overview stuff, um, a lot of it is like, you'll see this in the same report over and over. Same like appraisals. Same like appraisals, right? There's all like the, the stuff you see and then there's like the specifics for that particular property that they'll add to that section, right? So this right here, um, main panel, he wasn't able to check it out because it was locked. There was a key on it. And then so he'll put a picture, has a key, and he wasn't able to check the main panel, which that sometimes, happen, sometimes happens because the pg e is the one that has that lock, right? Um, but the one we're looking for is we're looking for that little scorch thing that he talked about. And it's not even in here. What would that be? I think that would be part of, it's not in here because I think that scorch thing was part of like the AC. So these are some of the water stains, furnace, has a little bit of rust on it. So there's probably something leaking here, but I'm trying to find, there we go right here. So what this was, is this was like the shutoff for the AC, right? And so some of these newer homes will have its own little shutoff, little breaker for the AC. Um, on most like older homes, you're probably not gonna see that it has like a separate, a separate shutoff. But this one, this is what they're talking about. They see scorch marks right here. And so what it was, is that I think the, some of the wiring got loose and it was causing some sort of like sparks or some sort of sh shut off or some sort of scorching. So then this whole thing right here was replaced for 400 bucks, right? And so basically in the details, all he did was just put the pictures of it. The comment is the same exact comment that you saw in the summary, right? But now you have a photo. So now you know what, what he's talking about. So now when you're looking at these reports, maybe you're at the house, you can say, okay, this is what he's talking about. Let's go take a look at it, All right? Um, give me some questions, guys, on this. What questions do you have? I'm not gonna go through every single line of the report because that would take a while. Um, but what I wanna show you guys is how to navigate through the report. That's really what this all is all about, right? How to quickly look at the report, quickly find the summary section, quickly see what items you need to go back and look at just like that. And then you can help your client determine, okay, do we need to get a contractor out here? Do we need to get an electrician out here? Or say, hey, that's not a big deal. Um, let me show you like one other example. I'm gonna go to summary page. And he said, some of the siding was damaged, right? Which would be like the exterior. So now if I find exterior, item number one, I'm gonna see what he's talking about. And if I look here, fiber cement siding, some or all of the siding is fiber cement. Um, repair, damaged fiber siding was observed. And so he's talking about this little chip right here. Mm -hmm. Some of these little cracks, little chips, a little nail piece that was chipped right here. Like having a scratch on a, on a, on a, on a used car. Yeah. So not a big deal, right? But you see, the, the point I'm trying to make is how I saw the summary, I found the item, and then I go back into the report and then I see the pictures and the explanation. Mm -hmm. And then I can tell my client, hey, look, it says there's some damage to the siding. Let's go take a look at that. If you look right here, guys, this just looks like wear and tear over time. Um, minor little nail holes, if you wanted to patch that up with some caulking or something, this is nothing that's gonna, you know, nothing that is like uh, life-threatening, hazardous, Nothing that's going to impact the value of the home or anything like that. This is some minor little wear and tear on the exterior, right? Yeah, no, I, I think when, when looking at this, if you're a first time buyer, it can be overwhelming. Like, oh my God, look at this big old packet, right? So I think it's important the way Enrique is explaining it in the beginning and then going to that summary, right? And just kind of pulling those things out that kind of that stick out that you may want to go deeper into or, or your client may have a concern. Yeah. Right. You may just show them that, that summary part. Say which part do you have a concern? Yep. This is what stands out to me. Yeah. 
And so the whole point is, is showing, like helping, being able to point them in the right direction, right? Um, being able to show them on the report where it's at and what it is. And then you tell your client, hey guys, is that a big, is that a concern for you guys? Is that a big deal? Is that a deal breaker, right? And then you also can recommend like, hey guys, out of all these items, like a lot of these are small, the ones that I think we need to maybe do some investigation are probably gonna be uh, maybe the leaks in the roof and the scorch marks, right? So we wanna make sure that's like not, uh, going to be a big ticket item yeah. and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to um, call my uh contractor i'm going to send him a picture of this and i'm going to just ask him roughly you know what this would cost to fix and then i'll get back to you right and that's where you can now go do your homework you get back to him hey guys he says like 400 bucks to fix this that patch that leak it's a couple hundred bucks like you're looking at less than a thousand bucks right on a on a 1.6 million dollar property thousand bucks it's kind of the cost of doing business, the cost of being a homeowner, right? Not a big deal. Sure. I was going to say, so our great homes are four to eight clean. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say the AC compressor, like the unit, was to be the same age as the home. And uh, your client was to tell you, like, hey, well, it seems like the AC, we're going to have to, like, uh, uh, put a new, a new one, like, sometime soon. Um, should we put less money now for, like, something like that? Um, should we put less money? That's a good question. So you look at the report, you determine the AC is, is old. Um, if the client thinks they have to replace it, should we offer less? So there's a couple of things that go into that, right? Just because something's old doesn't mean it doesn't work, right? So is it functioning properly? So if it's functioning properly, you're not going to like say, hey, like I'm going to offer you the cost of a brand new AC, right? Because you're buying a used house that doesn't have a brand new AC, basically, right? Now, can you say, hey, like compared to the other house down the street, that one has brand new, this one has a bunch of old stuff. That's why this one's worth more. Yeah, you can take that into consideration. But then you also got to take into consideration the market conditions as well, right? Like, hey, all the homes pretty much in this neighborhood are 20 years old. Most of them probably have the original AC, right? So, and they're still selling way over asking and they're still selling within a week. So it seems like people are still buying these and paying top dollar, even if it has some of these items that are happening, right? And that's kind of what I would say is, do you wanna lose this property over an AC that's still working? And maybe down the line, if you wanna replace it, you can replace it, right? And, and it's very true practical what Enrique is saying because when we were in that multiple offer market, mm -hmm. that's exactly what happened with one of our the, the furnace was at the end of life and the AC was as well, but it was both items were functioning. Yeah. And that's what they had to determine. Do we lower our price? And it came back to what's the market doing? Yeah. yeah. So that's going to be the motivator. But for reference, they have the same furnace and the same AC for over five years. Right. Yeah. They continue working. They, they've been doing maintenance and um, upkeep to it, but it's continued working. Right. So it's really going to dictate the upkeep. Now, if the report said that the AC is no longer working, it's broken, it doesn't work, it needs to be replaced right now, then every single buyer that probably buys that property is going to factor that into their price, right? Um, you know, but if there's multiple offers, it's probably going to override that, right? You know, because the cost to replace an AC, I mean, and even if you don't know, you could just Google cost to replace AC I mean you can even just get a ballpark on average you'll pay 5900 bucks to install a central AC unit right um, the average cost of AC is installation is 4000 though it can be as high as 16000 and that's going to vary depending on the size of the unit if it's a single story two story and stuff like that but on the high end 16 on the low end 6 grand let's say in the middle let's say you're at 10 grand to replace the AC and so now you got to ask yourself on this property, do I want it that bad? Is the market, you know, what's the market saying? And is 10 grand really make or breaking the deal, right? Now you may have a first time buyer who's buying an entry level home and they don't have a bunch of other cash to invest into this property. And so for them, that may be a big deal, but for someone usually buying like, if, like this house went for one, six, five, right? Someone buying a $1.65 million home, they were paying all cash. 
they have 10 grand to fix the AC if they needed to. My first time buyer, that's an FHA buyer that is buying an entry level home and all they have is 3% down. They don't have much savings and the house has no heater or AC. That's a deal breaker, right? That's a deal breaker because they don't have the money to fix it if they needed to fix it, right? And, and I look at AC as a, as a luxury. Like yeah. I grew up in a house that had AC. <laughs> so entry level house, FHA, again, guys, I, I would look at that, right? Because there's certain things that a house has to have. It has to have a furnace, has to have a kitchen, has to have a stove. Right? Yeah. But the AC is not a, a, a must have in a property. That's not required on properties, when, especially even for well, finance. Well, I grew up in a house with no AC, right? We had fans and we opened the window. Right. And so that's what we had to do. And it was until I was older that I got a house that had AC. Right. And I'm like, dang, this is what it feels like all these years. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. Well, that and it was, and it was, it was old and at the end of its life. Right. And so, so it just depends. It depends what your standards of living are. Right. And that's going to be different for every single person. So you got to, that's where you got to ask, you got to tell the client this is, hey, guys, looks like there's no AC. It's broken. If you wanted to replace it, you're probably looking on about 10 grand on average. Is that a deal breaker for you? Yeah. Right. That, and that's the way I would frame that. I was, I was just going to add things. Yeah. Like going back, it's like a town to area too. Because like, uh, if it's like colder weather, right? Like you're living in colder weather. It might not be like heating heaters or like, you know, like AC. It's like yeah. Like city, right? Yeah. Like yeah. You don't see a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Keep, keep it back to that. A lot of the homes don't have. Now, if you're in the Central Valley or in Sacramento, you have to have AC because it gets over 100 degrees like quite often, right? So yeah. for those areas, like those are deal breakers or those get negotiated through the, through the transaction, right? But out here, like there's a lot of people that don't have AC. And so it just depends on what, what the thing is. Now, if the plumbing was shot and like the plumbing's not working or the electrical's not working, those are like basic components that you need to live in the property, right? So those are things where you're you're definitely going to have people negotiating and they're going to factor that into their price. But I would say like luxury items or like deferred maintenance stuff, it's if the market is is really competitive, some people just don't even care. They just want to get their foot in the door on that property, right? Uh, I have a question. So in regards to, I know you guys fixed that, that, uh, that, that spark, right? Mm -hmm. Did you have any agent call you out on it or ask about it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I did is um, when I sent the agent the reports, I said, hey, FYI, the sliding glass door was fixed and the electrical thing was fixed. It was just a bad electrical, whatever. They fixed it, cost 400 bucks. Right. So you, when you sent that I let her know, hey, those two items, this is on there. Now, what you can do is you can go back to the inspector, pay them like another hundred bucks. They'll come back out. They'll take a new picture. They'll update the report. And so if it's, if it's like major items, I would definitely do that. If it's small little things, a simple explanation, and here's the receipt, like that works as well, right? And that wasn't even a, a big deal at all. They wrote a non-contingent offer. Okay. I, mean, I was wondering if they called it out, but you just disclosed it up front. She called out the sliding door, right? I, I disclosed the um, electrical thing. She called out the sliding door. I had forgot that the sliding door was in the report. And so she put a request for repairs. And then I told her, hey, that was already fixed, right? And so we just had that conversation and it was not a big deal. And then when she went to the property to do her avid, she could see that the sliding door was fine. Right. Yeah. And so for the buyer's agents, Enrique, what would you, you know, so if they look at the reports and had a question, because you're proactive and you kind of disclosed it. Yeah. Some agents may not do that. Right. So what, yeah. what would be their approach? As far as like, they see that and they have a question, I mean, they should reach out to listening. Obviously. Yeah. So best bet is to call the listing agent. And if the li listing agent is not that helpful, just call the inspector. Right. So what I would do is um, because you also know, right, like if the report looks really bad, but then you walk into a house and you could tell they just painted everything, they staged it like they fixed it up for the market. Some of those things might have been taken care of. Right. And so it, it's your job to say, hey, Mr. Agent, um, I noticed the report had these items, but it looks like the house like looks really good. So were some of these items addressed? Can you tell me? Like uh, there's like three major items that I'm, that my clients might be concerned with. What can you tell me about those? And they may say, Hey, no, we didn't touch those. All we did was paint and paint covers up a lot of stuff, guys, just FYI. Right. <laughs> um, so they can say, Hey, all we did was paint, you know, but those items weren't addressed. Okay. Well now I got to go back to my client and see where they're at. 
And then if I'm not sure if it's major or minor, then I can call the inspector, right? And ask them like, hey, I see this thing. Is that a major issue? So we'd be concerned. Do you know roughly what the cost is to fix something like that? Or I call one of my contractors or some a vendor that I have that can at least give me an idea and then give that information to my client and then determine how they want to move forward from there, right? Um, sometimes when there's like, there's different levels of agents too, right? That's the other thing. There's some agents and there's client, different levels of clients. Some clients like, hey, I want to fix everything because I don't want anything coming up. I want to get top, top dollar. And there's some clients that are like, hey, like I don't have the budget to fix stuff. Like I'm fine with painting, but I'm not going to fix all these other items. It is what it is. This is an old house, right? And so there's clients that are like that. And so you just got to understand that like you're not dealing with the same type of client, same type of agent on every single transaction. So your job is to, do your homework, do your due diligence, make the calls that you have to make, um, and then let your client know as well, right? Uh, okay, we're gonna move on to, we got a couple more minutes. We're gonna move on to inspection reports, The I mean, the pest inspection. And so the pest inspection is usually gonna be two different pieces. Inspect The pest inspection is only five pages, so it's a lot shorter of a report. And all the pest inspection is looking for is gonna be like termites, fungus or dry rot. Um, and that's pretty much what they're looking for, right? And you're gonna have section one and section two. So section one is typically anything that is active and that, that should be addressed or should be looked at. Section two is anything that um, you probably need to fix down the line or it's probably some, it's not urgent, but it's probably something that needs to be addressed down the line, right? And so it could be like, hey, it looks like there's, you might have termites, you got to keep an eye on that, right? Um, and that's basically what they do. Now on the termite report or the pest report, right? You can call it a pest report or a termite report. They give you a bid on what it costs to fix those items. On the property report that we just looked at, they don't give you prices. So that's the two different things because they're not allowed to give you prices on those ones. But the pest report, they are allowed to give you prices on those because those, uh, the companies are typically contractors as well, and they can also do the work. They, they can come out and spray the property, fumigate, and do stuff like that. So you're always going to have on the pest report two different pieces to it, the report plus the cost breakdown. Um, and then sometimes they'll have a third, third page, which is like photos of, of the items. So if we look through this report, guys, um, same thing. This was done on the same day. And usually a lot of times when you order reports, they'll go like, it's two different companies or maybe they're like buddies and one guy does the, the property, one guy does the pest and they usually knock it out uh, on the same day um, just because they have access to the property. But the first thing you're going to see up here is going to be um, anything, um, if any of the boxes were checked, that means they saw things that were visible, right? So they checked the box fungus and dry rot, other findings and further inspection. They didn't check anything for dry wood termites or ter uh, subterranean termites. And part of that was because on this property, it was recently uh, fumigated for termites. Now, about termites, guys, every property in California has termites, just FYI. It's just, that's part of where we live, right? They come from the ground or wherever they come from. I don't know, wherever God makes them come from. Um, but that's just where we live, right? It's part of where we live. The same thing, like in California, every property is like in the earthquake zone, right? Because we're in California, there's just, that's just where we live. I'm sure if you go to other states, they have like certain conditions that are just something for that state, right? Tornadoes, Tornadoes yeah, yeah. right? There you go. Tornadoes, hurricanes, tsunami, right? And that's just what it is. So when people, when people think termites, guys, termites are not like necessarily a bad thing. There's like levels to termites, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, there's like, there's termites that are just like a nuisance. And then there's like termites that are holding the house together, right? They're holding hands. And like, if they let go, the house is falling, right? And termites basically eat the wood, right? They eat wood and stuff like that. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not always a big deal. It's just, if it gets out of hand, then over time, it could become a big deal. Right. Can you, can you explain? I mean, I don't. What is that? The one the box they check. I mean, can you explain that? Like, if I'm a if I'm a buyer, explain those to me. Yeah. Right. So the first one, this is a complete report, right? That's what they checked. 
it's not a now if they if they were going back for a second time that would be like a reinspection report okay. or if they were going again like to add something that would be a supplemental but this is like the first complete report that they did so that's the first thing and then um they checked the box of whatever that was visible to them based off the access to the property so they didn't check uh termites because there was no termites but they did check dry rot or fungus and they did have some other findings and then they did have some items that say further inspection. Right. So dry rot or fungus is basically anything that comes from like water damage, right? Can you show pictures of that or no? Yeah, there'll be pictures here. So if something gets wet, like wood, and then it stays wet, it can get fungus on it or it can dry out and it could be dry rot, right? That's basically it. Um, and if you look here, they typically draw a little diagram of the home. It's not always exactly to scale. That's why it says not to scale. And then anywhere where there's a little like three little circle, 3A, 2A, that's basically they're telling you this is where we found something. And then so you can figure out where it's at, right? Yes. I'm just thinking right off that, it's like all in the corners, it looks like. Yeah. Is there a tendency for homes to have more dry rot than fungus up there? Yeah, around the eaves, right? Yeah, yeah. Water because down. water comes in, you have gutters. Sometimes the gutters are not like completely like sealed. You get water in the cracks. Right. Like it's just con it's really common that eaves have um, some sort of uh, dry fungus or dry water, or water damage. Next time you go to a property, just pay attention to eaves and you'll see if the wood looks like it's chipping. Right. And like splintered. That means there's probably some sort of dry, dry rot or water damage. Yeah. And so there's different ways that they fix that. Right. Like they either can cut the wood out and put brand new wood. Or they can also like try to scrape some of it out and then put brand new paint and kind of seal it, right? Because paint acts as a seal. So it just depends on, on the extent of the, the damage. Um, okay, so all these little, little dots here is where they found something. So now let's go through it really quick. Um, all this right here is all just like your common disclosures, right? So this is, you're going to see this on every report. Um, by law, they have to just say like, it's like ad advisories and disclosures, right? I'm not even gonna go into this. You guys could read this part. Um, what I'm looking for, right? I'm not looking for any of that because you'll see that on every report. It's like I your- I think it's important to understand that, guys. Explain that to everyone. Like, hey, look, this is a, a report that there's some standard information that's in there. What we're gonna look at is what's specific to this property. Yep. We're gonna go into that. So, um, so I usually go to section one and section two, right? So now you're coming in here. Um, and so I'm immediately looking at what are the items on here, right? So item 2A, dry wood termites have damaged the wood trim. Recommendation, remove the wood trim. If no further damage, replace with new material, prime and paint only. And then it says, no, the structure has recently been fumigated for dry wood termites, right? Now, here's the thing. If the termites eat the wood, you can treat the property and kill the termites but then you also got to replace the wood if you want to do it all the way. So some people just treat the termites, but then they don't want to spend money on changing all the pieces of wood because maybe it's not like a major deal, right? It's not like the house isn't going to fall, right? So in this case, I don't think they changed the wood out, which is why he says it's damaged, but they did treat the termites because whenever they fumigate, they have to put a sticker that says when they fumigated and all that stuff, it's, it's the law, right? So there's no active termites, but there's probably some damaged wood from the termites that were there before, right? Um, fungus has damaged the wood trim. Remove the damaged wood. If no further damage, replace with new material, prime and paint. And you'll see right here, this is a section two item. Section two is like monitor this, right? Section one is like, hey, this is like something going on right now. If you guys, you guys should replace it now if you want to do it right. Um, same thing right here, section one, fungus has damaged the fascia board on the barge rafter. So this is like the eaves as well, which if we looked at the other report, the other report already mentioned that. Now this is just going into more detail. The toilet was loose. So we already saw that in the other one. This is a section two item, remove the toilet, reset the new toilet on a new wax ring. Not a big deal. Leak stains were noted in the attic. Owner is to contact appropriate trades to inspect and repair the furnace. So they're saying it's from the furnace pipe that was leaking. This is a section two item. Further inspection, much of the interior walls in the garage were inaccessible due to the occupant storage. So if the garage has a bunch of stuff, they're not able to look at the garage, right? 
And so it just says, um, upon request, you guys can move everything. We can go back out there and we can inspect that. And then the property was fumigated on June 26th um, by this other company. Any questions, you can call that company. And that's pretty much it. That's basically your report. Now, what we're gonna look at now, and this is sometimes what we do, like before we even look at the report, we just go to the cost sheet. So if I look at the cost sheet and I see section one, they're quoting 1150 for that item, 715 for that item, section two, 600 for this item, 350, further inspection, 195. So if I look at my total for section one, 1865, for section two, 950, for further inspection, 195, my total is 3000 bucks. It's nothing. And just FYI, these guys are contractors, right? Their costs are always gonna be a little bit higher. If you were to go like hire like a handyman or like someone else you know, or your guy, they'll probably do it for maybe 30% less, right? So that your 3000, you might get it done for 2,500 bucks. And so that's also something that I do tell the clients, right? Like, hey, if, you, if we go find our own guy to do this, it'll probably be a little bit cheaper than this, right? This is gonna be like your worst case scenario. And so if I'm looking at this property and it's a $1.6 million property and it has 3,000 bucks right here, another thousand bucks to fix those other little items, 4,000 bucks total on a 1.6 property, not a big deal. Yeah, most of them were section two, right? And the ones that were section one was pretty much like just dry rot and stuff around the eaves, which is very, very common, right? So this is how I'm explaining it to the client. I'm just telling them, hey guys, honestly, this is not a big deal. Um, these are things that can be repaired really easily. And these are even things that you can choose to live with for a little while until you, you know, decide to repair them, right? And then I put that on them. Does that make sense? Is that a deal breaker for you guys? Do you guys feel comfortable moving forward? Like sometimes you'll see some of these reports and there's like, 20,000 or a 30,000, right? Um, and then that's when you really got to like dig in and see what it is. Now, I'll give you a, a story. There was one, uh, Rob had a listing where they had like a $50,000 on this section one thing, right? And it was like, what the 50,000 bucks? Like, this is crazy. Um, but after looking to it further, what happened is the inspect, they had the house had a deck on the back. Right. And it had an old deck that was attached to the property. And so the deck was like needed to be replaced eventually. Like it was, it was working, it was painted, but it was an old deck. Right. So the wood was bad. Um, and so in the report, he said that that deck needs to go. And then he put a bid if he did the redid the deck for you guys. And the bid was like $30,000 just for the deck. Right. So out of the 50 grand, like 30 grand of it was him giving you a quote to replace your deck. Right. And so if you're a buyer and you look at that, you're like 50,000. Right. But then when you further look into it, you're like, yeah, it's if you want a brand new deck in the back. Right. Like, and that's this guy's price. Right. Like if you're going to, if you're going to replace the deck, you're going to probably go find your own contract or someone who specializes in decks and it's probably going to be a lot cheaper. Right. And so, so that's where you want to just like the price is one thing, but then looking at the items and seeing are these major or minor items, and also getting uh, being realistic is like that price way out of line, right? Um, and then finding um, the answers for your clients basically so that they could feel comfortable. The other common one is like the overhang, right? You have your house and then you have like that overhang and then they'll, they'll point out, the inspector will point out all the section one work on that overhang. Mm -hmm. It's not an actual where you're living in the property. Yeah, right. So sometimes um, we had that like with the property we sold where the overhang was on Harwell it was an old overhang and that thing was like falling and like, it was just super old. And so they put like on there, like a bid to replace it. And I was like, we're not gonna replace it. We're just gonna remove it. We're just gonna tear it down, right? Now the cost of tearing it down was gonna be the labor plus to dump it, all the wood. But that was a lot cheaper than us trying to go replace the whole overhang, right? The patio or whatever you call it. And so, like I said, is it's, you got to like, make sure you're looking into the details when you see things like this. All right. Any, so I think we, I think we addressed it, right? Like, did you guys get the idea on like the different sections you asked, like what items are major or not? How do we explain it to a client? Um, 
What major components do we look at, right? And just, you touched on foundation. I want to touch on that. Just FYI, guys, cracks in the foundation isn't always a deal killer, right? Um, there are a lot of foundations that have cracks on them, but there's different types of cracks. There's like vertical cracks and horizontal cracks. And so for some, um, a lot of properties move and shift over time, right? Because of the earth move, settling and all kinds of stuff. And so it just really depends on, on the nature of that, right? And so I've seen properties where there's cracks in the foundation and it would cost like a thousand bucks to just go fill those in with like the special epoxy, right? And then I've seen some other ones where it's like, no, like there's the cracks are like, you know, two inches, you know, two or three inches wide. And like, they're running on different directions and like that structure is not safe, right? And so that's where it, it just depends on the extent and, and what you're dealing with. But there's a lot of people that own homes right now that have cracks in their foundation and they never address them, right? I've also just seen a lot of people going around the Bay Area who like will be elevating their homes and just redoing their entire foundation yeah. of cement. That's true too. And it's getting more cost effective too. So it's like not ridiculous. Yeah, and especially a lot of the old homes. I remember we got a bid on, on this old home that we had an investment property downtown where the foundation was a hundred years old, right? And so there was a couple options was to, one of the options was to raise the house, right? Replace the whole foundation and then like just rebuild it, right? And so for something like that, it was like, yeah, eventually that foundation's gonna have to be replaced. We did one in San Juan. We also did one yeah. um, at airport. Yep. Probably replaced. I think the lesson in that was that the bid was really high Yeah, that's actually a good a good uh, story to share, and I'll, I'll end with that one. So, we were um, this was a property we were trying to buy for investment, right? So I was representing the buyer to try to buy this property to fix it and flip it. And this this is now this is a lesson on why you want to get your inspections done. So the inspection report said that there was cracks in the foundation. Now, when there's cracks in the foundation. Um, you can go now and hire a, a contractor or hire someone to give you a, a bid on what it would cost to fix that, right? These people, because it was like a trust sale and it was like multiple family members, they didn't want to pay for the inspection report because it was going to be like another 500 bucks. And so we put our offer in, got it accepted, but we got a, a contingency period. So then we went and we contacted like an engineering company right? To give us a, an inspection and a bid. And they came back with like $80,000 or something crazy, right? Because if you go to like a big giant company, that's like an engineering company and all that, like they're, they're charging you like full retail price. And it's like, uh, you're going to pay a lot more. Um, so we use that bid to go back and renegotiate with the client. And we got the property like 75 grand lower, right? And so it cost them $75,000 for not paying a couple hundred bucks more to go get the right inspections. And then what we did is we said, okay, this is what that guy would charge us, but we had our own contractor. How much would our contractor charge us to fix these things? And it was like 15 grand, right? So we use a $75,000 bid to negotiate, lower the price, and then we fixed it for 15,000, right? And so that's where we created a huge profit margin in that property. Um, and that's why when you're gonna, when you're working with a seller, if you're representing a seller, you absolutely want to do the inspections up front. Mm -hmm. And if there's something on the inspections that's gonna be a red flag, like such as the foundation, um, you're gonna wanna like go get the appropriate bid or anything, anything like that to to use that in your favor. Cause someone will like a smart agent will do what we just did and they'll negotiate the hell out of you. Right. And they'll use it against you. And so we were, we had the upper hand and we're like, all right, yeah, here's, here's your full price. I didn't think we got any less than like the 75 offer. Yeah, I think what we could also leverage was the, the energy and time that it would take to manage that. Structure. Yeah. I, 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 I want to say the bid was like, I don't know. It, it was a long time ago. The bid may have been like 50 grand, yeah, but, we got but then we got 75 because we said, Hey, it's 50,000 to fix it but it's going to take us like three months yeah. and it's going to do all these things. Right. So there's also a time delay. Yeah. So we'll take this house. If you give us 75,000 off. Right. And for them, like they were like, yeah, we have no other choice. Yeah. It was, they had like four people and they were like, all right. And they're like, I'm all, we could close next week basically if you give us this, this deal. So for them, it was like, they're like, you know, F it, let's do it. You know? <laughs> and like, and then we ended up getting that deal on that property. Right. 
Um, all right, guys, any last questions? That's all I got for you. Hopefully you guys learned something today. Um, I don't expect you guys to remember all of this. And so the best bet is like, read your reports, right? Um, you always want to read the reports, always go to the summary section and then go back and like really try to see those items. And if you have a question on an item, reach out to one of us, right? Like we can point you in the right direction or like I would say 80% of the time, we'll be able to tell you like this, this is a big deal or not. And then if we don't know, like I have someone that I could just text really quick with a picture, one of our contractors, and then they'll let us know a, a rough idea of what it costs. Yes. Surprise, on the summary section, it's always good to be but the inspectors are human as well. So don't just rely on the, on the summary. That's true. They may forget to put something. Um, the other thing too is there's different levels of inspectors. There's some inspectors that are doing like 10 a day, 15 a day. They're driving all over the Bay Area and they're just trying to in and out and their, their inspections aren't thorough, right? And when you're representing a buyer, you don't get to choose the inspector, right? So... There's also like, and you could tell when you go to the house and you see all like, yeah, this house looks like there's a lot of things wrong with it. But then you look at the report and the report doesn't really have anything on it. That's a red flag right there, right? And that's where you might want to say like, you might want to bring that up to the listing agent's attention. Like, hey, I see visually like a bunch, like even the eaves, like all these eaves have dry rot. It is, there's nothing of dry rot in your report. So like, was the guy blind? Like, well, you know, what happened? Was it... <laughs> You know, and so, hey, we're going to we're going to need an inspection period. Right. And it's OK to get your own inspections, even if one was already provided to you. If you don't feel it's sufficient, then you got to do what's right for your client. You got to say, hey, let's offer on this property, but let's ask for maybe a two or three day inspection period. And let me have my contractor come out here with your report and look at it. Or maybe we just order our own full inspection. And it's better to pay six hundred bucks for an inspection and decide if you want to move forward versus moving forward on a home, you didn't do your due diligence. And then you find out there's like thousands and thousands of dollars worth of stuff that wasn't mentioned on the reports. Right. And that's where your job is to help clients avoid costly mistakes. Right. And I would use this story, like the story that I'm telling you, use that story when you're talking to clients. Right. Um, all right, guys, that's all I got. Thank you for coming today. Woo!